I have math socks, I have laundry socks, I have winter socks, and I even have coronavirus socks. You may conclude that I have socks themed for each occasion, but that would be a false conclusion. Most of my socks are actually black. So today we're going to take a look at what are some of the pitfalls you can run into that lead to an invalid conclusion and how to avoid those. Thinking that results in accurate conclusions is vital. If you have even one error in your reasoning, you can draw a conclusion that's not true. We have to be careful with the word assume, as the root word would suggest. But a premise is a statement that we take to be true. If that assumption isn't true, any argument that we build on that is also going to be a faulty argument. So I want you to pause the video and take a look at these two arguments and see is each argument valid. If a premise is a statement that we assume to be true, I've drawn a Venn diagram to help organize the information. Our first premise says that everyone driving at 90 kilometers per hour is breaking the law. So 90 kilometers per hour, that is in the category of things we could do to break the law. Now we also are told Kai is driving at 90 kilometers per hour. So I put Kai into that circle there and therefore Kai would be breaking the law. In our second argument, we have the same initial premise, Rose we're told is breaking the law. So I put Rose into the breaking the law circle, and the conclusion that's then drawn is that she's driving at 90 kilometers per hour. But that's not necessarily true, because there could be other things Rose is doing where she's breaking the law, and she's not necessarily speeding. So if we take these premises in argument one to be true, then our final conclusion would be a valid argument. In the second one, our final conclusion would not be valid. Sylvan Lake is a town in central Alberta that is known for its water activities. I want you to consider whether or not you think this is a valid argument. Val lives in Sylvan Lake. All people who live in Sylvan Lake like to swim. Therefore, Val likes to swim. I would say this is an invalid argument because of the word all. Not everybody who lives in Sylvan Lake necessarily likes to swim. Therefore, that argument would not be true. What about the second one? A pound of Julia's special blend coffee costs more than $22.75 per pound. John didn't buy Julia's special blend when he purchased coffee. Therefore, John didn't spend more than $22.75 per pound. I also would say that's an invalid conclusion. Just because John didn't buy Julia's special coffee, there are other brands of coffee that could also cost the same amount or more. So it's not necessarily true to say that just because he didn't spend that much, he didn't buy her coffee. We're going to switch over to the mathematical side right now, where there are three main types of errors that can occur within a proof. In the first one, we have somebody claiming that they have proved that negative 5 is equal to positive 5. Well, we know right away that's not true. Let's go through the argument and try to identify where the error is. All right, so we're going to go step by step here. So first of all, we have Liz who assumes that negative 5 is equal to positive 5. That's not true. So every statement that follows is going to be built on something that's not true. So at this point, it doesn't matter what she puts down after. Everything else is incorrect. Her argument is invalid. The first type of mistake you can make in a mathematical proof is to begin with what we call an invalid initial assumption. You will also have to be very careful when you set up your arguments in this particular unit because as soon as you make a mistake, everything that follows is now incorrect. In the second example, Joel is trying to prove that the sum of four consecutive integers is evenly divisible by the number of integers in that set, so in this case four. Before you even take a look at what the other person does, you want to in your head have some idea as to how you would set this up. So we know sum is addition, and we can represent the first integer with the variable n. So in this case, Joel's off to a good start. He's then going to take the next three integers, and if whatever n happens to be, we're going to add one to get the next integer. And that's true, going back to what we know about consecutive integers. Let's say this is 5. This is now 6. 2 more than 5 would be 7. 
three more than five would be eight. So these do represent four consecutive integers. So, so far he set this up correctly. All right, so now let's take a look at what he does now. It looks like he's combining these terms together. So we've removed the brackets, which is okay, and we are just adding them together and then dividing by four. So he's ultimately trying to show that the sum of these is evenly divisible by four. So he's got that set up okay. So now let's keep going. So now he simplifies this. So using what you know about math, we know we can only combine like terms together. So there are four n's, and when we add up three plus two is five, plus one is six. So mathematically, he has correctly added those together and divided by four. Okay, so now he simplified this down. If we're dividing by four, we have to divide every term by four. Four n divided by four is n, but uh-oh, he's got a problem here because six divided by four is going to be six over four or three over two, not six. The second type of error that you can run into in mathematical proofs is if there's a calculation error or a mathematical error. And the question will ask you to identify it. You have to be precise. The only time you're allowed to circle the entire Entire line is in the first case if it's an invalid initial assumption. Any other error, you don't want to circle this whole thing because it looks like you don't really know where the mistake is. Precisely identify just the one piece that's incorrect. It should have been three halves, not six. Everything that follows is now incorrect, so it doesn't matter what he does after that. Okay, go grab your textbook for the last one, and we're going to take a look at the third mistake that can occur in a proof. So we have an individual who says he's going to prove that 2 equals 0. So we know there's got to be a mistake because that is just simply not true. He begins by saying, let's let A equal 1 and let's let B equal 1. Now, I purposefully did not copy this into the notes because I want you anytime you see a proof like this is to just cover up what the person's doing and you try to set it up based on the statements you're given. It's easier to catch a mistake that way. So in this case we have a equal to b because they're both equal to 1. So now you can take a look what did he do and see so far so good we're on the right track. Now if you follow the right hand column in your textbook we can see that he squares both sides. That's okay because what I do to one side in math I can do to the other. So so far so good. The next thing he's going to do is subtract b from both sides. And again that's okay because algebraically what I do to one side I have to do to the other side. A squared by minus B squared, those are not like terms, so I'm still going to just have the two terms there. B squared minus B squared is 0B squared, which is 0. So I'm going to write that down. Now check what he did, and again, so far so good. The next thing he's going to do is factor this as a difference of squares. So check, can we factor this as a difference of squares? Well, it is a difference, and both terms are perfect squares, so that's okay. So now without looking at what he's doing, we're going to do this. We know we have to set up our conjugates. One is a plus, one is a minus. Square root the first term and square root the second term. Now check, is that matching what he did? Okay, so, so far we're good. Now the next thing he's going to do is divide both sides by A over B. So we're going to divide this side by, or sorry, A minus B. So we're going to divide this side by A minus B and we're gonna divide this side by a minus b. Now we know a minus b divided by a minus b is one, so that's gonna cancel out. And we also know zero divided by a minus b is going to be zero. So I'm going to just on the right, write down my a plus b, and then on the left, I'm going to write down zero. Okay, so now check, is that what he has? Yes, now he has a one there, we don't need to write that down, but we do have the same value. Now he simplifies, so basically we're dropping the brackets. So we've got a plus b is equal to zero. And then going back to what he started with, a is equal to one, b is equal to one. Adding up those two terms, one plus one is two, two equals zero, we proved it. But that can't be. Mathematically, there's no calculation error in his work. So we went through and we checked that. So what is the problem? The third type of error you can have in a mathematical proof is that the person is dividing by zero, which cannot occur. So if you can't find a calculation error, go through the proof and look at any point as their division, and then check the value of what they're dividing by, because we know we can never divide by zero. So in this case, going back to his initial uh, premise, a is equal to 1, 
as is b. So if I substitute those in here, if a is 1 and b is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, and that is a problem. So the third thing you're going to watch out for is at any point, is that person dividing in their proof? And if they are, check, is the value of that 0? If it is, there is an error. And the final thing you want to avoid in your proofs when you're building your arguments is what we refer to as circular reasoning. You're basically going around in a circle. You're saying this is true because of this, and then that's true because of this. This is what we're trying to ultimately prove. You just keep going around in circles. So you need to bring in other pieces of information to support your argument to draw to that conclusion you're trying to make.